Good afternoon and welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. My name is Nicola Koslina and I'm a lecturer at, um, in the School of Private and Commercial Law here at UNSW Law and Justice. I'd like to acknowledge the Bidjigal people, the traditional custodians of the unceded land which we meet, on which we meet, and the first peoples to use language and to create and hand down knowledge in this area. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here with us today. So the format for our panel this afternoon will be as follows. It'll be a short introduction, and then we'll have approximately 50 minutes of questions to the panel, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of audience questions, and then a quick five minute wrap up at the end. So the title of this afternoon's panel is Looking Into the Black Mirror, AI and the future of legal education. Writing in The Guardian, Charlie Brooker, the creator of the TV series Black Mirror, explained, the black mirror of the title is the one you'll find on every wall, on every desk, in the palm of every hand, the cold, shiny screen of a TV, a monitor, a smartphone. The series premiered back in 2011 and depicts near-future dystopias with sci-fi technology. Adrian Martin of Screen has described the series as follows. Many episodes explore basic human emotions and desires that intersect with and get twisted by a technological system that invariably spins out of control and into catastrophe. Hmm. We know that within just two months of ChatGPT's debut, almost exactly a year ago, it had reached 100 million active users, including many university students. A certain percentage of educators the world over went into AI shock. Would all of our students now rely on AI to generate their assignments? Would they use AI tools to outsource their critical thinking? Would they bypass similarity detection software by simply copying text newly generated by AI. Generative AI does give us cause for concern, but it also has potential to be a transformative tool for teaching, learning, and assessment. This afternoon, our esteemed panel will analyze the broader landscape, exploring both the confounding challenges posed by AI and the potential opportunities for legal education. Our speakers today are Professor Toby Walsh. Toby is Chief Scientist at the AI Institute of UNSW Sydney. He's a Laureate Fellow and Scientia Professor of Artificial Intelligence in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. He serves as Research Group, group Leader at Data61, the Data and Digital Specialist arm of the CSIRO, and as an Associate Member of the Australian Human Rights Institute at UNSW. He is noted for his work in artificial intelligence, especially in the areas of social choice, constraint programming, and propositional satisfiability. Toby has also served on the Executive Council of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. Please join me in welcoming Toby. <laughs> Professor Sally Kift is a Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Law, and President of the Australian Learning and Teaching Fellows. She has held several university leadership positions, including as Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic at James Cook University. Sally is a National Teaching Award winner, a Senior Teaching Fellow, and a Disciplined Scholar in Law. In 2017, she received an Australian University Career Achievement Award for her contribution to Australian higher education. Sally was a member of the Australian Qualifications Framework Review Panel that reported to government in September 2019. And since 2017, she's been working as an independent higher education consultant. If we could welcome Sally. <laughs> Associate Professor Kate Galloway is a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy, an award-winning internationally recognized leader in legal education, and has served as the editor-in-chief of the Legal Education Review um, since 2016. She established the peak body for Law Associate Dean's Education, LEAD, um, and has served on the Executive Committee of the Australasian Law Academics Association since 2015. 
She assumed the chair in July of this year. At Griffith University, she's been the Work Integrated Learning Coordinator for Law and in May 2023 was appointed the Director, Career Readiness for Arts, Education and Law. In this role, she provides strategic leadership in enhancing students' work-ready skills throughout the group's programs. Kate is also the Education Lead at Griffith's Climate Action Beacon. We welcome Kate. And last but not least, Alex Steele. Professor Alex Steele is Pro Vice Chancellor Education and Student Experience at UNSW and a professor of the Faculty of Law and Justice. Alex is an internationally recognised legal academic with interests in both criminal law and legal education. He has numerous teaching awards, including a Commonwealth Government Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning. He was previously Associate Dean Education in the Law Faculty and co-convener of LEAD. <laughs> He is a founder member, founding, foundation member of the UNSW Scientia Education Academy and former director. If we could welcome Alex as well. Okay, my first question is for you, Alex. I want to take you back to when we first started hearing about ChatGPT and its capabilities. As someone with responsibilities that include overseeing curriculum and modes of assessment, what was running through your mind? How did you feel reading about and seeing firsthand what the capabilities of Gen AI might be? Um, thanks, Nicola. Um, so, uh, so look, I, I had been playing with it um, from September the year beforehand. So I, I knew what was happening in the, the AI playground um, a few months beforehand. So it wasn't a complete surprise to me as with to what- GPT-3. Yeah, yeah. Um, with what GPT-3, looked like, um, but the ease with which you could do it was phenomenal. And I think my immediate reaction was, oh, this is too fast. No one's gonna be ready for this. So I'd assumed that this would eke out slowly and we'd have some students who were way ahead of us who were cheating and we'd have to find them, you know, as a slow sort of evolution. But it was just released without any real warning and going into Christmas where nobody had any headspace to deal with it and then everybody was offline basically for January. So I ran around annoying my family all of January saying, look, look at this, look at this. And they just told me to shut up. But it, it really got to that point of we got back to university and um, people were just turning up and discovering it and discovering it slowly too. So it, we, we didn't really start term with the entire university aware of what had happened. So I, I think all of term one was really just trying to get everybody to understand what the implications were. Can I, could I add something to that? Can I, I'll, can I tell a little story, which is, I, th I think it surprised, it surprised people at the university, but it completely surprised OpenAI. So the story I've, I've been told um, is that they had actually given it to an internal product group to reevaluate, and they'd played with it, and they come back with the observation, hmm, interesting, but what would you do in it? Which I think is actually quite a good summary. And um, they were having the meeting in October when they were going to decide what to do with it. And the proposal on the table was that they should just bin it and say, well, it's an interesting learning experience. We need to pivot and focus all of our resources on GPT-4, which was they just started to ramp up to train that. And they eventually did throw all the company's resources at training GPT-4. And Sam Altman, um, said, well, wait a second, what if we just give it to the public? Well, what would we see what happens? And they had no expectation that it was going to be the hit it was. And th the way that you know this story is probably true is if they'd had any idea of the success it was going to come up with, they'd have chosen a proper name for it. <laughs> Thanks. My next question is to um, Kate. Now, we're hearing that, you know, chat GPT and generative AI is everywhere. It's going to be an essential skill that everyone needs to have. So I wanted to ask what AI might mean for conceptions of the job ready graduate. Is this just another arm of the digital literacy that we're all supposed to have? Or is there more to it, do you think? The answer to everything is yes. <laughs> so Everyone's losing their minds, but again, no one really knows what to do with it. We know that it can work if it's trained on the right materials, and we're hearing stories coming from the profession about bespoke 
uh, platforms that are being developed that are trained specifically on certain types of, of law or for specific purposes, that's going to require a significant investment of resources. Um, I know of um, uh, public interest litigation providers, uh, not-for-profits, that are concerned about their um, how they compete in, in litigation if they're up against big law firms that have access to these resources. But I, I'm not quite sure in real life where that's at. Um, this is anecdotal only, but I've spoken to a number of junior lawyers who are in big law at the moment, and they report that the partners keep coming to them saying, well, what do you think about you know, AI? What do you think? And their response is actually quite measured, which is we're required, we're paid for precision, and I just can't see so far that that precision is there. So, so it's going to destroy everything and yet no one is using it. I don't know. There's some, something in between. I just want to observe that when I've played around with it, I've played around with it to do a number of different things. So uh, can it find law? Can it solve legal problems? But also it is an effective communication tool. So it can rewrite the stuff that I already have. So those are three core skills of law students and three components of the job of lawyers. So when we're talking about it in a, in a, disamb in a disambiguated sense, right? so when we're not actually being sufficiently precise about the types of tasks that we're talking about. There's a paper out in the 9th of November, it's up on SSRN by Troy Monaghan and Schwartz who've done a test in Minnesota University Law School in, in the US where um, they have trained their students to use it in various tasks. They've found that it makes uh, a difference in efficiency. The most difference is made for the lower performing students, uh, um, but they have tested it on what I would describe as drafting exercises. So there's a the, the, the nature of lawyers' work is quite diverse. Um, there's a lot of turn the handle work that lawyers do that could that we know we've known for decades could actually be automated, but lawyers either won't do that or, or can't do that. So um, I think that there's probably room for additional tools within legal practice, which means that it's another tool that we need to teach students how to use. Do we already teach students how to use legal practice software and those other sorts of tools? No, we don't. I don't even know that they get access to that in their PLT. So is it yet another expensive form of software that we don't teach students about in law school? Um, that Those are sort of open questions. And my next question is to Sally, um, just following on from that. To what extent should university legal education be leading versus accommodating the demands of the profession as a general matter? As Kate mentioned, partners are coming to junior lawyers and saying, you know, what do you think? Should we do this? And they're the ones who seem to be pushing for students to know about these things. Um, is that kind of something that is an unhelpful binary in terms of who should be leading and who should be following? Or is it okay to take a more measured approach? Is there a bit of kind of overexcitement from the profession? Uh, so thanks, Nicola, and hello, everyone. Um, look, of course, we should work with the profession on this, but our, the current um, segmentation across the academic requirements, the practical legal training requirements, and continuing professional development, which are all very siloed and never meet together, is particularly unhelpful in this environment. Um, and any tight prescriptive thing that we did or the profession did in terms of requiring knowledge for entry level practitioners um, is only ever gonna be a one-off point in time thing which isn't going to satisfy continuing competence if that was even a requirement. Um, following the Flip Commission inquiry here in New South Wales, which a number of you would be familiar with, um, that recommended that there be seven areas of knowledge and skills that, of course, all needed to be dealt with pre-admission, um, and technology was one of those. Sandy Clark, who was chair of Law Admissions Consultative Committee at the time, 
Um, oh, sorry, subsequently, when he stepped down and he wrote in the ALD Australian Law Journal, he said that would have been unrealistic to require law schools to do all of those things, in addition to Priestley 11 plus 1 and um, all the current PLT requirements. The Law Society of um, the Hong Kong Review of Legal Education also said that it was um, an impossible task for everyone to try and do all that. The other flip side, I'm getting to a point in a moment, so they wanted us pre-law, um, pre-admission to do seven areas. They had a very gentle recommendation around sending off to the never-never to decide whether um, the legal profession might need some ethical or other regulatory dimension around technological competence or innovation. And as far as I'm aware, that's never happened. So where we are at the moment, when Kate's young lawyers enter the profession, remember what we're responsible for. We are responsible in the law school for 11 areas plus one of statutory interpretation, academic knowledge. They don't mention technology. The PLT, these are the profession's own accreditation requirements. The PLT requirements, which are very extensive and very detailed, again, the profession's accreditation requirements, they don't mention technology. And I was on the Law Council of Australia site earlier today and I looked at the, because I don't really spend a lot of time looking at them, the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules, which are the ones that generally regulate solicitors, con um, solicitors' conduct across Australia, they don't mention technology. So we're in this regulatory vacuum at the moment in terms of what these requirements are. A great push on law schools and PLT providers to do everything about it up to point of entry, but no actual requirements. Sandy Clark recommended, which I would endorse, we need to be thinking about legal education and training as a continuum now. And then we could allocate the responsibilities across the legal education and training um, um, <clears throat> range from law school to PLT to, to um, um, continuing competence if there was even such a thing. So what we do at the moment, I think, is we continue to do what we've always done and virtuously comply with Priestley 11 plus one, 11 areas plus one of content knowledge, We've got the Australian Qualifications Framework. I was on the review, as, as Nicola pointed out. It also says nothing about digital literacy at the moment, but it does, it does um, canvas a lot of other skills. So we can virtuously comply, we're regulatory required to comply with that. We've got the Council of Australian Law Deans, Law Standards, um, Law School Standards. Um, they don't mention technology. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, I haven't looked again at the most recent one, I don't think they do. Um, and of course, university graduate attributes. So we'll just do what we think is good in the best interests of our students and just let all that hubbub happen around. Thank you. So I think that leaves us with the issue that we're not required to teach our students about AI, but we have a different problem. So Toby, I'd like to ask you the next question. In your latest book, Faking It, Artificial Intelligence in a Human World, you explain that the concept of fakery and the drive to imitate human intelligence is really at the heart of the AI project. It must be said that one of the key fears we as educators have is that AI will be used by students as a substitute for their own thinking. We've seen that generative AI can automate quite a lot of different types of writing. How close are we to AI's automation of thinking? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, in, interesting question. We've still a huge great distance to go. Um, indeed, what, what I take from the success of tools like ChatGPT is that we've overestimated human intelligence in the sense that there's a huge amount of human communication that requires minimal intelligence. It's quite formulaic, and we have taught those formulas now to machines. Um, so you know, a business letter is quite a formula, and now I've written my last business letter. I now take the four dot points I want. I say, write me a business letter that covers those four dot points. And it writes me a nice polished business letter. And then I say, I look at it and say, that's not angry enough. Write it a bit more angry, please. OK, that's too angry. Um, and you know, that communicates what I do. Of course, the irony is going to be that, that companies are going to be receiving a lot more angry business letters from people like myself. They will use ChatGPT to summarize them back down to the four bullet points. <laughs> so the letter was just an inefficient way to, 
communicate those four dot points. Um, but they're not understanding language like you and I are understanding language. Uh, my favorite example that I discovered a few weeks ago, unfortunately after the book had come out, so I couldn't include it in the book, but you asked ChatGPT, how many bees are in the word bananas? And it will tell you confidently, there are three bees in the word bananas. And actually it's worth understanding why it makes that mistake. It makes that mistake because it's saying what's probable, not what's true. There are lots of places on the internet where people ask questions, and it's been trained on, about how many A's and how many N's in the word banana, because people struggle to decide whether it's two or three. So the answer to any question about letters in the word bananas is two or three. If you ask it how many S's in the word bananas, it says there are two S's, Toby, in the word bananas. Because any question you ask it about the word letters in the word bananas, it knows that the, those questions always have the answer two or three. And so it's not understanding the sentence like you and I are understanding the sentence. But in many settings, that's good enough to communicate what you need to communicate. But to match human intelligence, the, the depth of human understanding that we have about language is going to take a, a long while. But these are very, nevertheless, these are very useful tools. They're, and unfortunately, we focus on their ability to generate, generate text or generate images or generate video or audio. And actually, I think one of the more important capabilities that they have that we will be tapping into a lot in legal and other settings is their ability to summarize and synthesize information. So they're actually quite good at taking a text and pulling out of the text. Uh, and they'll get better, don't worry. We're not, not perfect yet. Uh, and, and increasingly, because now, for example, you, the latest generation of tools, you can give them the input as 100,000 tokens, 100,000 words, essentially. It's a, a novel or a, you know, a decent number of legal judgments. And they're very good and very focused if you say, answer a question based upon this text of focusing on what's in that text and extracting the sentence or sentences or uh, something meaningful out of that text. So that ability, um, if you think about what we do as knowledge workers, many of us, all day, is summarizing and synthesizing information. And now we've got some pretty powerful tools. They're not perfect, but pretty powerful tools that will get better and better. And I, the, the other mistake to make is to think, is to look at what we've got today and not think it's going to, just as ChatGPT was a huge, great advance on GPT-3, much more focused, much less hallucinatory, um, the next iteration, again, is going to be much more focused, much more that you can't just because you see weaknesses in the tools today, don't suppose those weaknesses is, are going to necessarily exist in the future. Thank you. Um, and my next question is to Alex. If, um, as Toby says, the business letter is a thing of the past and we can just outsource many of our more routine or mundane summarizing or general communication approaches, but as Kate suggests, we're not quite there yet in terms of producing synthesis of a legal judgment, for example. What do you see as the key responsibilities of the university as an institution in terms of access, training, and guidance for students and staff in dealing with ChatGPT and its use? Okay, small question. Um, is the mic working now? No. Um, I think it's a societal problem. Um, it, it's, it's generational and it happened overnight. So um, every other technological advance has come on us slowly. This one just happened. So we're all playing catch up. I think that the biggest problem is going to be that um, the younger you are, the quicker you'll pick it up. So that means primary school kids are going to be the fastest learners, which means that every person who's educating a child is going to be behind the child very quickly. So we are, we're last in line. By the time they'll get to us in a couple of years, we will have people who are incredibly adept at these things. But what, they, what I think the, the, the really interesting sort of question is, it's very good at summarizing knowledge. It's not really designed to generate new knowledge or generate new creativity. It, it may develop capacities to synthesize, and that will be really interesting to see how, how far that can go. But what, 
at the end of the day, I think coming back to what Kate was saying is you're never going to uh, rely on an a, a AI generated um, document um, as a submission to court. You're always going to need a human with knowledge and with some wisdom to actually read it and go, yeah, that, you know, the 99, it, that I think the, the handle turning for lawyers will be the reading of AI generated documents and saying, yes, that one, that one's okay. This isn't the, you know, the straight banana. That this banana's bent, this banana's bent, that banana's bent. So, so w there's a factory working aspect for humans now in terms of trying to make sure that the AI hasn't gone rogue. So how do you actually know whether or not the AI output is accurate? And that's, I think, the existential question because at the moment, all of our students um, from sort of a couple of years into their degree have learnt things without AI and so they can use that knowledge to then interrogate the AI. The, the next group of students coming through will start to rely on the AI before they learn and, and that's, that's a bit of an issue. We're already starting to see with international students and translation software that if they're very if they're lacking confidence in English, they'll rely on the translation software, which then means that they don't practice and they don't build the confidence in English, and then it becomes really difficult for them to get offered. So one of our big issues is going to be, how do we build resilience and um, confidence in students to actually go and do their own research rather than with the AI? So I'm not sure that answered the question. I just got carried away with that. <laughs> but I think the other thing too that I think is really interesting in all of this too is, one of the things, particularly in law, that we've had to, to become a good lawyer, um, you need to be able to concentrate for long periods of time. You need to read long passages of very boring text that don't have pictures or diagrams to explain where it's going. You've got to build in your mind uh, that connection between the beginning and the end, work out what the structure is. If AI does that for you, then does that mean that the perfect lawyer in the future is somebody with ADHD? the ability to very quickly go backwards and forwards between AI output to AI output to construct the best output. So it's that, is that speed of processing what we're after rather than the ability to slow down and concentrate. So if that's the case, we have to completely flip legal education. Can I, can I add, throw in a metaphor here, which is the calculator. So when I was a young boy, I remember calculators being introduced and we quickly realized that you don't, give you don't give people in primary school a calculator. You get them to learn how to use numbers themselves first. And then afterwards, we all, I have a calculator on my, on my phone now. I have, a calculator on my, I have a calculator on my body all the time. I need to do calculations, but it was important to learn how to do numbers. And similarly with legal argument or the, using these tools, it's important that people learn how to reason and communicate and summarize and before they get given the tools, because otherwise they'll never learn those skills. Thanks, Toby. And Kate, just following on from um, Toby's comment and Alex's um, description of some of the things that we need in terms of loyally skills, in your work you focus on exploring the nature of practice-ready legal knowledge. So what do you think is needed and how might AI detract from or enhance this kind of knowledge and those kinds of skills? I always tell my students, you cannot escape knowing the law. You can do whatever, whatever you do, you, you just can't escape that reality. You might even be able to scrape through the subject and you might even be able to eke out a career, it's, but at some point you are going to have to know the law. My biggest concern is it actually one it's kind of related to AI, but a lot of our students now are just watching videos and not reading texts, not any text at all. So their literacy skills, in fact, are devolving. And that's a, a massive concern. So once you throw an, yet another tool that's doing the summarising for you into that mix where students aren't engaging with, comp with any text, let alone complex text, I'm actually concerned about that capability for um, for comprehending the depth of knowledge that is required. Um, I'm, for those at the University of Queensland in the 1980s, I'm going to invoke our um, conveyancing and drafting lecturer, Stanley Robinson, who always said to us that lawyers are dealers in the language. And it's always struck, it's always stuck with me that we're dealers in the language. And now we're coming up with a tool that is 
in a different sense, a dealer in, in the language. I, I think that along with you cannot escape the law, you must, you must continue to deal with the language. Uh, you can get the AI to do your drafting. We use precedents all the time, but, but those levels of literacy remain really important. Um, and, uh, and I think that there's another facet to this, which is that I see legal practice and the legal profession as a large organism. So the other thing that I tell my students, I'm a very boring person, um, is every letter you write is an enactment of the law. Anything you produce can end up in court and be challenged and change the direction of the way that we do things in society more, bro more broadly. So we, the, the fact that we are constantly enacting the law a, as a profession, we are constantly learning and adjusting. Um, for those of you who've been in legal practice, you know, you'll get a letter in from the other side and you go, I'm just gonna pop that in my filing cabinet, like an actual real metal one from the olden days. Um, you know, because that could come in handy one day. I've seen the way that someone else has done this and I'm gonna save that and I'm gonna adjust my practice. Most firms have banks of precedence that are adjust adjusted from time to time. And as a transactional lawyer for 16 years, you know, I, I could glance at a lease and know what year it was drafted. I can glance through articles of association and pick the bit that's weird, that's that, like I'm a bit AI myself, you know. So, so but we adjust these, all these documents and these, and these benchmarks change from time to time just within through human endeavor so now we're throwing in another tool that will inevitably change i'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing but we need to be conscious of it if that's what's going to happen we've got another tool coming in that is going to introduce a new and much faster method of change and if we don't understand what is happening at this profession-wide level we leave ourselves exposed to changes that might not be desirable. So, uh, so what are the implications? I think there are implications for knowledge. I think there are implications for the literacy that underpins that knowledge, simply because it's all very well to say, don't give a primary school child a calculator or, or whatever, which I, you know, fine. How are we gonna, I, I, I hate banning things. I'm not a fan of banning things, but how do we actually this is an, uh, you know, how do we educate in a way that we can, where students are engaged in this high stakes environment of getting high marks for their degrees. A lot of students don't necessarily, as much as we like to think that they do, they don't necessarily want to learn, they want to get through with high marks, right? So we're actually, we've generated a system where it is rational to use these tools that we can't stop students from using. So, so the sorts of questions we're dealing with aren't necessarily about the tools themselves. There's actually much, there's, are they bigger or meta? I don't know, one or the other. There's underlying structural issues with the way that education has been sold to the public and its purpose and how the, what the outcomes of that are that potentially erode um, the capabilities that we still believe that we need in lawyers. And Sally, just building on what Kate has mentioned about these fundamental competencies and the potential for those literacies to be kind of eroded um, in the process of using chat GPT or other generative AI tools. What role do you think reflective practice as a fundamentally human competency might play for students, for educators and for practitioners in forcing people to um, engage with the work that either they or an AI has produced um, and kind of forcing them to revisit that literacy through reflex reflection? Yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting question. And again, I think presents a challenge for us as educators. Of course, reflection is important. It's the way people learn. We don't, or well, we rarely explicitly teach reflective practice in the current environment where lifelong learning has to become a practical reality for everyone as they need to up and re and deepen skill over the course of their working life. 
reflective capability has become far more important. Um, <clears throat> it comes back also to um, the, the regulation of, um, of, comp of legal competence. For continuing competence in particular, um, Jordan Furlong, who a number of people around the place are very fond of, I just love the way he commentates on just about anything that needs to be disrupted in his own right. He points out that adult professionals, adult professionals, that might be one of the first problems, um, <clears throat> um, don't learn by sitting in 10 hours of lectures. Now, our continuing competence requirement at the moment, so, much, so far as it is anything, it is 10 hours of fairly unreg very lightly regulated um, engagement in, in continuing professional development. Jordan Furlong rightly points out that adult professionals, the way that they would assure their continuing competence would be able to reflect on their existing competence and try and find the gaps in their knowledge and, and think about what they needed to do to improve, think about where they're good and perhaps where they want to become great, or think about some new skill that they need to learn, do something about that and come back again and then start that whole process again. So we've really got to, and, and when you see um, a body like the Law Society of Alberta, which actually has a very um, well-defined um, <clears throat> competency framework, a professional proficiency um, profile, they refer to it as. They have an open source reflective capability module that even has on the website a reference to Kolb's, this is a law society, has a reference to Kolb's experiential learning cycle on its website so be because, and this will come as a great shock to everybody, Apparently, legal professionals are not great at being reflective. So when they're asked in a continuing professional development way to understand what further knowledge, skills or values they might need, they need to be trained in the reflective capability. Little slight segue, I was on the Australian Qualifications um, re Review Committee. I know, it's a, it was a dream, it was wonderful. <laughs> But one of the things that we've recommended is that we include under the general capabilities the need, that need to be developed in the context of the discipline are the core skills for work. And you might say, mm, that's very interesting. Well, the core skills for work include um, a reflective capability because there needs to be this metacognitive ability now for, for, for everyone to constantly be reflecting on not just you know, what my AI piece was or should have been, but what 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 are the skills and knowledges that I need to to improve? I just want to make sure. Oh yeah. So my last point was going to be about um, evaluative judgment. So we've heard a lot from the Cradle Assessment Centre at Deakin University talking about evaluative judgment. And again, if I would have had my way, I would have put that in the AQF as a as a as a lifelong learning skill essentially but it's much the same evaluative judgment in order to, for me to be able to assess the quality of my own work and the quality of others. And that extent, my own work now will be me interacting ethically and responsibly with the AI and the technology. Um, so evaluative judgment is just another way of thinking about um, reflective capability. And the way that we, that, that we embed evaluative judgment in law school is through peer assessment, self-assessment, um, and, and those various reflective um, opportunities we have. So very long-winded way of saying, evaluative capability always was important for learning. I don't think we put much emphasis on it. Now we must, because we're not going to be able to operate in this new environment without it. Excellent, thank you. Um, Toby. at a societal level, what do you see as the key ethical issues bound up in the construction, training and operation of generative AI technologies. If we're going to be ethical lawyers, then is AI something we should be using? I think the, the most immediate and pressing problem is the one of the intellectual property. These tools only exist because they've been trained on vast tracks of human knowledge I wrote an opinion piece for the Australian about um, six weeks ago. And at the time I thought, ah, the headline's a bit dramatic, it's a bit, bit over egging it here. Um, but in hindsight, especially since we've just learned about book three, the, the 
database of 200,000 books that these models have been largely trained upon and um, scraped without consent of, of the internet. Um, the title of the piece, the opinion, that, the opinion piece I wrote for the Australian was called The Greatest Heist in Human History, which was all of our cultural knowledge, all of our scientific knowledge, all of our economic knowledge, all being absorbed into these giant models at, without consent, without any respect for the copyright, without any respect for the intellectual property. Now, the courts are going to be deciding for a number of class action suits going down in the US that are going to set important precedents. But I don't see, I, I'm, not, I'm not a legal pr practitioner, so I'm not going to hazard a guess as to how the courts are going to come out of, and, and decide what happens. But I can't see this being sustainable in the sense that, um, that if you take away the intellectual property and possibly the livelihood of people, um, that you have to, it, copyright was invented to protect that. And I was, as an example, I was getting in an Uber a couple of days ago, and the Uber driver used to be a graphic designer, a freelance graphic designer. Uh, I suspect he's a canary in the coal mine in the sense that um, his, his work, he said, just dried up overnight. That these tools were obviously much cheaper, not as good perhaps, but much cheaper than he was, and he wasn't able to compete. Um, so I do think we have to resolve that issue um, and work out, well, what is an appropriate recognition of the intellectual labors that went into these tools, but without which they would not be being, being as good as they are and they'll all get better as well. Um, and uh, from a technical perspective, if you, if you wanted to train a language model, for example, to speak English, to be able to read legal judgments, you could have trained it on Project Gutenberg. So all of the outer copyright books that have been scanned and available now. Um, you would end up, with, even would be interesting, you'd end up with a language model that spoke quite archaic English. Methinks that might be quite quaint. Um, but they didn't. They, 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 they trained it on you know, my books, lots of people's books um, that were in copyright without our consent. And that was a deliberate choice, not only so that they would speak in contemporary English, but also so they would have a contemporary understanding of all of the content of those books. The reason that ChatGPT can speak about anthropology to zoology is because it's been trained on texts that include all our knowledge about anthropology to zoology. Um, and uh, I think we're going to have to resolve this issue about well, how do we adjust our intellectual property laws and the framework around which we try and encourage and reward the people for making those labors. Because uh, the, the reason that these tools are so fluent is because they're trained on human output. And indeed, there is an interesting um, idea circulating in the field at the moment that this might be the golden age. Because at the moment, 99% of the internet is human. It's human generated quality output. We're already now, the second generation of these tools are being trained on the outputs of the first generation. Um, and so then we may be training on the exhaust fumes. Of <laughs> and that could be problematic. Any small biases might be amplified in this we, as we keep on training and retraining on the same things. Um, so we may, in 10 years time, we may look back and say, well, that was the, that was the moment, that golden moment where the internet was full of beautiful human generated content and not full of all of that synthetic machine generated content. Well, the scraping of intellectual property without consent is certainly um, a huge issue that we face in relying on chat GPT or other generative AI that's been trained on that material. But Kate, you recently convened a workshop on legal education and climate literacy in the core curriculum. Given the extractive and exploitative nature of generative AI technologies, rare use of rare earth minerals, huge use of energy, and the training of the models using um, labor from the global south um, that sometimes has involved quite traumatic experiences. How do we navigate the contradictions of advocating for things like climate literacy and the sustainable development goals um, in law curricula on the one hand and encouraging the use of AI by students and ourselves in order to be job ready on the other? Well, 
It's a big question. I flew here in an aeroplane yesterday, just by way of disclosure. Um, I mean, we're at a time in history where to exist in the contemporary world, we consume things that have been disastrously extracted from the earth. Um, no one person can make a change, although if everyone takes steps, theoretically, everything would change. But where in the where where we live in a capitalist society, people are going to keep making money. I mean, one of the observations that I'd make is some of what I read about the potential for AI and legal practice in terms of efficiency means that legal services will become cheaper. And I laugh and laugh and laugh <laughs> because the partners of big law are not going to give away their profits, right? So, so this is, it's part of the capitalist project. And if we're really genuine about grappling with the climate crisis, there are two, um, two schools of thought here. One is that uh, one of my colleagues says, if you think that we can solve the climate crisis without engaging in capitalism, you're an idiot. And the other school of thought is we need to overturn capitalism because that will allow us to uh, enter some kind of utopian age. I think that possibly neither is correct on its own, um, but I, I, I don't know how you stop the juggernaut of capitalism because that's what this is. Um, knowledge is money. Um, it's all concerning data. Data is, data is the new asbestos, isn't that the thing? Uh, and, and they're gonna keep producing tools that harness that until we run out of them. I'm sorry to be so negative about this. Can I be a little optimistic? Yes, you can. So much to my surprise, and you know, and I was a proto-Marxist, I guess, in my youth, I have been pleasantly surprised that capitalism, rather than politics, is delivering on the climate front at the moment. Yes. Corporations are doing much, much better than politicians in terms of actually turning us around to net zero. So uh, much, to, much to my surprise, I'm actually rooting for capitalism at the moment. So is the answer, you know, consumer advocacy for, you know, um, open AI to use um, more sustainable methods of finding rare earth minerals or using, you know, solar power for its um, energy use. Can I tell you how, how extractive is it? It's more extractive on humans than it is on the planet. It, um, the, the energy use uses actually are actually not the, the the, the major harm that's being done. Um, da global data center usage of, of the world's energy in the last 10 years has been pretty um, static. It hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down, despite the fact that we're using, um, you know, we, this has been a doubling of the amount of compute for every, every uh, 18 months, two years. The, the data centers have been getting more efficient. They tend to run on green energy. Uh, as an example of a corporation doing the right thing, um, Microsoft, is going to be carbon's um, carbon. I always get these the wrong way around. Which is which is carbon neutral, not, which is carbon zero. I can never remember. I can, is is going to reducing its carbon footprint. Is is to so, a negligible level. So yes, yeah, so Microsoft is going to reduce its carbon footprint to <laughs> to it it it, it um, absorbs as much CO two as it, it as it gives out by 2030, and by 2050 it will have gone so carbon negative that all of the carbon it has ever produced as a corporation will have been eliminated from the atmosphere. Uh, which is, yeah, I don't know whether they're going to achieve it, but, but that's, a, that's a laudable ambition. So that means you have to go for Bing, is that right? Google's going to be the same. They're all, they, because once one of them does it, the other will do it. But, that, but it's a good example of how... Of, the energy usage then is not the thing that we should be worried about. We should worry about the usage of humans. And you, you were hinted at that, the way that people in the global south are used to, to label these models, to, to the, the way that people in the global south are used to content moderate and the harms that that does to those humans. And, and on that, now that Neuralink has been um, approved for insertion in the US, so that's Elon Musk's um, implant, brain implant. I mean, which is just, 
I, I just can't even begin to talk about how disgusting that is, but um, I mean, I'm neutral on it. <laughs> um, but once you've got AI beaming straight into your brain, if you want to talk about harms, I mean, this is just going to be a moving feast. And this is the problem with, with AI, right? It's a dual use technology. There are people, paraplegics, for example, who are going to be given back the ability to communicate, the ability to, to walk. Um, we, amazing gift that we can give those people. But equally, as you say, an invasive technology that will be able to read our thoughts. In a good way. You, you can get your dream. I don't think there's a good way to read your thoughts. Oh, the, ja the Japanese have just released a, um, a device that um, can replay your dreams to you in a video the next day. I just want you to sit with that for a second. <laughs> well, again, again, that's a good, lovely to do a use, because I always forget my dreams, so it'd be nice to be, yeah, yeah, be reminded yeah. of what my dreams are. That's what a dream But then when I see for. them, I'm probably going to be horrified. So <laughs> there's a reason I forgot them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my last question is to you, Alex, and I thought I'd end on a practical note because it's never too late to start being practical. What are the three most useful things that AI can do for us right now as educators? Is that that? Yes, yes. Uh, no, no, not marking. No, I can't do marking because it's human evaluation of student effort and it should never replace the overarching academic judgment of a student. But it can certainly do, and, and when I say that, I mean that in a summative way, if you are actually ranking or grading students. But certainly it can replace a whole lot of very bad marking that we do, that we don't need to do, where we can have sort of um, formative assessment for students. So I think one of, the, one of the first things that AI can do practically is it can allow us to take a deep breath and let go of lots of our assessment. We just don't need to constantly test students in that way in a, in a human interaction kind of way. We can actually start to build tools that will allow the students in a more personalized way to actually be able to build themselves up to where they need to be to move on to the next part of the degree. The big issue, that, the big issue there is going to be motivation for students. If we do it badly, it will demotivate students. They will feel as though they're just a machine in a, a cog in a machine. So how do we make it personal? How do we make it real? And that means I think we need to be involved in that process all the way through supporting the students. So it's not, it's not a complete replacement, but I think it, it will have a major impact on the quantum of assessment that we need to be involved in. Um, I think it's also going to be enormously helpful in a whole lot of the mundane bureaucratic um, getting ready to teach, um, reporting results, um, you know, the, the stuff that kills you, the, the stuff that takes away the, the love of your job, all of that stuff, that, that's really what AI is for. AI is there to follow rules. We're not good at following rules, let's face it. We're, um, you know, genetically um, bad at following rules. A, we're humans, and B, we're academics. Um, so... And see, we're lawyers because when we see a rule, we'll find a way around it, right? So, so um, AI will be very obedient. It will be very patient. It will be very compliant. So I think a lot of that sort of pain that we have it, um, can, can be dealt with. Um, and then I think AI also um, will give us um, very quickly um, as the, the, the big breakthrough, I think, in chat GPT was the chat aspect of it. It took away that barrier to being able to access the technology. As we move into really much more intuitive approaches, so we have sort of, um, you know, the, the whole barrier to coding um, is disappearing with low code and no code, and then it will just be, have a conversation with the AI and it will produce things for you. And as it starts to be able to produce um, um, sort of combinations of text and video and things like that, um, we will actually be really, really challenged, I think, to become creative again. Because I think one of the things that if, you know, I'm, I'm a long way away now from when I started my academic career. But when I first started, I was given sort of classes that have been taught by other people and I thought, I can do better than this. This isn't me, I'll write it myself. I'll write, I'll come up with a new way of doing it. And so for the first period of my career, I was constantly changing and fiddling and redoing things and getting into trouble and getting out of trouble, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. And then there's a point in your career where you just go, I'm too busy 
um, it works. I'm not really going to put in the effort anymore. I'm going to focus on something else. So I think that what AI will do is will take away the, the, the barrier of production of teaching materials and classes and um, scenarios and that sort of thing. And it will be there instantly. So we'll be challenged to actually be really creative about what we're doing and really think about, is this actually working for the students? And the AI will tell us when it's not as well, probably as part of a sort of a proofing exercise. So I think it's going to really bring us back to being really creative in the way we teach, in the way we assess, and the way we, we mark. And I think that's really going to be fantastic for students. So they're my three. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to ask the, um, the other three panellists if there's any last remarks you'd like to make, starting with Sally. Um, so I'm, I'm just coming back to how we can um, assure competence around this fr from, from, from our pre-admission phase into the early um, career phase for new lawyers you know, potentially under the 18 months of supervised practice, which is unsupervised, um, and then on to continuing competence. And I really do believe that we, if t t to settle this um, and to put our hand on our hearts and be, you know, the good lawyers that we would want our students to be and for us to be, we really do need, this is going to be really boring, a competence statement that has a very high level um, requirement around keeping abreast of, of technological change and understanding the risks and, and, and um, benefits of them because it goes to, and I think we had that sidebar discussion over here, um, effective and efficient practice. And I'm aware that there was a, a court decision in Canada where, um, uh, where the bill of costs was reduced because the lawyer um, put in way too much claim for research, which he could have done via via technology, you know, so, so they're some of the interesting things to be thinking about. But I think when we do that, then we can have a sensible discussion, as the Law Society of Scotland has, about what, what, are, the, what are the threshold entry level requirements for technological competence? What are the early, what, what are, what are the early career and continuing competence requirements? And for those who want to be a legal technologist, you can do a specialisation. Um, so let's have let's have that discussion. But the but the competence that's identified amongst a range of other competences um, needs to needs to be sufficiently high level so it doesn't get dated too quickly. And I and I think then we can start moving forward and having the robust conversation across the profession that we need. Thank you, Sally, and Toby. Uh, I'm just going to. Uh, warn people that this is going to be a rapidly evolving field. Um, it comes back to the observation that it's already in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. This technology is now quite accessible. And so it's the imaginations of hundreds of millions of people who are going to uh, come up with novel ways of manipulating this technology to do interesting things. So uh, just to reinforce something that Alex said about you, obviously you wouldn't, you wouldn't give this responsibility to mark students' work. But you could, and it will get better even at this, you could, for example, give it to the students and say, before you hand in this work, I can't possibly give all of my students individual feedback on their drafts, but this thing can. It can critique the drafts and suggest areas where maybe they need to put it in work, even suggest whether it's going to give them the, the first class um, to mark that they need to, to finish up this course on or not. Um, so, that's something that just we couldn't have done before, that you could now do. And one of, the, one of the really fantastic sort of things to think about is it will make your feedback friendlier, kinder, and more supportive of students. And I think it's, it's human and AI together makes us better teachers. It's not one or the other. Okay, a, a final observation about knowledge. So we're all obsessed with the Priestleys and the coherent body of discipline knowledge and all of the things that we think that lawyers need to do. In fact, lawyers don't need, most lawyers don't deal much with knowledge at all. And the story I tell is when I was in charge of knowledge management in a firm back in the day and the family, we had two, uh, two loose leaf services we had for family law. We had the Butterworths and the CCH. And I said, we're doubling up, why do we need two? And he said, ah, 
the Butterworths comes out with the updates on the first of the month and CCH comes out in the middle of the month. So depending when in the month my matter is, I've got the most up to date. And if my opponent only has the Butterworths one and it's later on, I'm ahead. Because they were dealing with digested, uh, digests of updates to the law. And in reality, most busy practitioners only ever deal with digests. Most practitioners do not read complex cases and think about things. We do that all the time and we expect our students to do it. And we have this imaginary world where practitioners do it. But actually, most lawyers just do processes. And so to the extent that we're all, including me, so anxious and deeply concerned about the nature of knowledge and what our students actually know, in fact, so long as they don't steal money or have sex with their clients or, or tell secrets out of school, they're probably going to be okay in the profession. Um, that's probably my closing remarks. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, I'd now like to turn it over to the audience for any questions you have for our panel. Thanks very much. That was great. And um, Cornelia Koch from Adelaide Law School. I've got sort of two related questions. They're probably more at the university level, I think. Um, the first is, so we heard this morning too, that there's quite a bit of skill involved in doing right prompts so that generative AI works well and that that um, is probably an important skill for us humans going forward. Uh, and um, so I'm wondering, because, you know, we all now somehow need to get on top of this, whether this is really something that, could be done outside of the law schools, as in that the university could be running, should take on the responsibility for running course for all students um, to say, look, this is how you use generative AI properly. Now this, and maybe, I don't know if this is, but you know, it could be online modules or something. My university makes online modules on 500 things all the time that every student has to do or so. Um, but at the same time, too, if we do need to teach it, so real training for academics, because so far, the only things I've seen is, you know, how can academics get on top of hopefully their students not cheating, but not how do you actually use this usefully so that that could be taught to the students. Um, and I think the, 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 the and out of, if, it, if it's in all schools, would there be any sense, and is this maybe being done already, to produce some sort of a, a, a bespoke generative AI tool for law schools that is being fed with legal sources so that it's actually a useful tool rather than spitting out a lot of useless things for the students. Do you want me? Um, I, I, is that on? Yeah. Yeah, I think the answer is yes. No, I, and, and we can get AI to do it. Um, that's, that's the, so, I mean, there are already lots and lots of courses on the internet um, about how to use AI. They'll be out of date the moment they're put up. Um, it's just, you know, evolving so quickly. The thing that sort of, from, from, from my end, the, the thing that slowed us down in being able to do any of this has been finding a safe space. So where student data doesn't leave the university service. And I think we're getting close to resolving that. Um, but the, the, other th the other question about sort of, um, sort of specialist um, large language models sort of, um, that, are, that are just trained on particular things. I mean, Toby was talking about this to me before. It, it, it is, it's, it's actually the obvious thing to do. So that once, we, once we've got our sort of service set up, we're gonna have, I, I think we could very well in a few years time be at a point where, so um, I'm sort of going backwards um, step by step in my answer. The first thing I want to go back to is, will there be an expectation that everybody who's employed in a university to teach knows how to use AI? So is that, is that basically going to be a, an expectation of the job? And how long will it take for us to get there? And it's not going to be long, I don't think. So we are going to have an entire, um, we've got an entire sector that has to be retrained at speed. Um, the trouble is, when do you start the training? When is the, when the, when is the technology stable enough for you to say, well, here's the basic level? Um, but then once, we, once we've got that sort of um, training um, underway, then I think we then have a situation where 
Once we've got um, servers that can um, safely store all of the student data, do we then get to you know what sometimes described as citizen developers? So we basically got every academic has the ability to use their own little version of, of ChatGPT or, or whatever particular platform they've got inside the safe server to build their own models and to use their own student data. So you want to know how your students are going in a course. Rather than go to the university's sort of laborious system, will you just do your own interrogation of your student data to find out what you need to know? So it, it could be that very soon we get to a point where once everybody's literate, this is just a, a, a tool that you use in your day-to-day work, -day work. So I think it's, the question is, how do we get from here to there safely and without bankrupting university? Yeah. Uh, just to expand on that, um, uh, yeah, I've told my VC that you're gonna, why not accept the inevitable, you're gonna be teaching everyone at the university about AI. So let's go, let's start doing that. Not just every academic, but every student. Um, that, that it's hard to imagine a job that AI is not going to be a useful component of in the future. Um, so we might as well get to that point. Um, on the specific of prompts, I can pr promise you that we won't be, we won't have to learn. Prompt engineer is the shortest lived job ever. <laughs> I, I, and the reason I know that is that you and I didn't have to agree how to converse. You just spoke and said things, and I understood what you said. It is a sign of the, of the weakness of the stupidity of the tools that at the moment you have to phrase things in very precise ways for them to understand and do the right thing. As the tools get more and more mature, like when we interact with other humans, we won't have to agree the, the way that we express things. You can say things in multiple ways, and I'll understand you whichever way semantically and mean the same, and the same will be true eventually of the tools. So um, I'm here, I'm Nicole Graham from Sydney Law School, I'm the Associate Dean of Education there, and I want to remark upon the um, gentle, gradual transformation of discourse in my own law school um, over the past uh, 14 months or so. And the discourse was characterised um, almost exclusively at the beginning of this journey by fear and anger. Um, and now it's emerging um, excitement and curiosity. Uh, we had um, a fantastic panel only last week from um, a handful of colleagues in completely different areas of law teaching, um, all but one in the core curriculum. And they just shared how do they use um, artificial intelligence in their work as an academic. Some of them talked about what they did in relation to their research, and they had four or five different AI programs open at any one time so that they could compare and contrast the output of those. And then they were sharing their experiences about how they used it to integrate into their teaching practice. And I guess the reason that I'm sharing that is because something I know for sure is that this is a, a one-way cultural change piece is we're not going backwards, we're going to continue down this path as if, you know, in the same way that once fire was invented, fire was invented. So, I mean, invented, right. But um, the thing that is going to Sally's point that's really important for us is in relation to what we know to be authentic assessment. And one of the problems that we have with that is that many law academics increasingly, since the requirement for law academics to have PhDs, is that we have a number of people who are not like Kate and who might not have ever practiced, let alone for 16 years. So we do have colleagues who are responsible for the education of between 500 and 1,000 students per semester in core curriculum minutes of study in which, in legal practice, the use of AI over time will increase and increase and increase. But their own experience of, of it is from the experience of an educator, not as a lawyer. So I think this is an opportunity for us, the reason that I find this exciting is because this is an opportunity for legal educators to work much more closely with our colleagues in the legal profession so that we can better understand how it is that AI is used in uh, all kinds of practice because we know that the legal profession is incredibly diverse in its practical uh, function operation. So this is a chance for us to stop being pure scholars, pure educators and to reconnect um, with the core of our discipline, I guess. 
And I'm just so glad that we're having this panel because it is exciting. And we have to stop having conversations about integrity every time we talk about AI. It's so much more than it. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it, and just that, that final comment about integrity, if there's, an, if there's an integrity issue with the assessment, there's an issue with the assessment. So it's about new assessment and it's just hard to imagine at the moment, but there has to be other ways to do things. Hi, uh, my name's Paul Aikon, I'm from the UNE Law School. I'd like to address my, it's probably more a Q&A comment rather than a question, but it's in relation to what I understand you said, that you have a colleague that talks about lawyers at dealers in words. Is that correct? Lawyers at dealers in the language, oh, yes. In the language, okay. Yeah. Uh, in uh, our advocacy unit at UNE, which is compulsory, uh, we use a resource that was written by Beverly McLaughlin. Um, for those of you who don't know, she was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, um, a QC, and also a member of the Privy Council. So what I tell the students is she's heavy artillery so far as the legal profession is concerned. And her famous quote from that paper, 2001, is... Words are our tools. Words are our tools. And uh, I think we really drum that into the students and it's along the lines of what your colleague says about uh, dealers in language. And I was very interested to hear uh, what you said, but you can add words are our tools to your... Uh... Excellent, thank you. Well, thanks to the adult for uh, your insights. Uh, I'm Gary Ann, I'm from the US Language School of Economics. Um, we're actually piloting an AI tool uh, where we're, it's partially trained on concepts in the course to actually reduce hallucination on the, the person um, said earlier. So uh, we've been thinking about what does the world look like actually if these AIs don't hallucinate? And I think a lot of the uh, discourse over has been about the current state of you know, ChatGPT and what that looks like, how that affects our current assessment, but I feel like the university is not looking, you know, what eventually it's going to stop hallucinating or maybe not fully stop. Maybe it'll be 99% or just as good as a human because a human doesn't really 100% have, have 100% accuracy with anything as well. So I wanted to ask the panel, uh, you know, if we make that assumption that we just have an AI that doesn't hallucinate, you know, maybe it's like superhuman, maybe it's just at the bare minimum, it, you ask a question, you can, you can know that it's telling uh, what you think is the truth. What is, how does education change? How does the legal profession change? You know, is knowledge really that important um, from, from a human perspective? Do you want me to have a go? Thank you for that. So I think about this a lot. And uh, no, that doesn't mean that I'm right, by the way. Um, a couple of things. Legal practice operates on a number of different registers. As academics, I think a lot of the time we tend to be thinking about things like high court judgments, which are at the pinnacle of legal creativity and novelty and um, or, or appellate judgments in any event. So you've got the court hierarchy, you've got the ones at the top that and they they generally have some of the brightest minds, legal minds in the country. Um, coming up with novel arguments and testing them before others of the brightest minds in the country who were the judiciary. Where language, words are our tool, uh, where deal is in the language, language becomes nuanced. People can't believe that lawyers are losing their minds over all sorts of uh, ordinary words and this sort of thing. So at that level, I suspect it's going to be extremely difficult for um, a large language model to be able to come up with those kinds of arguments. At the lower levels, we already know that certainly in judgments, which is uh, um, uh, uh, computer programs can with increasing accuracy um, come up with the right sentence, for example, for someone who has been charged with a crime in the lower courts. 
um, just based on routine facts. So a lot of legal work is quite routine. And I think that there's, for a long time, we've known there's been tests about that sort of thing. And we know that that happens. In terms of transactional practice, you have negotiations that occur with multiple fact scenarios. You can work out your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, all of those sorts of things, which are just complex matrices of facts and, and positions. And I imagine that at that level, things could be worked out in a fairly straightforward way using, using a machine. But there are other sorts of negotiations that are much, that are complex in different ways that will require some sort of interaction and skill. In terms of documents, the same thing happens. If you are a, if you are acting for um, Stockland or one of those big, or Westfield that has all of those leases and you've, you've, got, um, you've got a standard lease that you need managed across the country, you can do that with machine, uh, some sort of um, technology very easily. But if you are negotiating um, a, a merger and acquisition with complex moving parts, uh, multiple parties, etc., you're going to need to have um, that needs to be bespoke. We already know the difference between bespoke work that needs to be bespoke. Um, Richard Susskind um, has been a legal technologist, has been writing about this for two decades. So there's a, th this is what I mean. It's very hard. We talk about the legal profession as though it is homogenous, but in fact, the nature of legal work varies greatly and its susceptibility to disruption by technologies will vary according to the type of legal work. Um, I think, and Richard, this aligns, I think, with Susskind's work, some areas of legal practice will always need to have a human brain. It's very difficult to imagine them going without it. So the big challenge for us there is how you actually train the human brains, not how you train the AI. But if you're not doing that turn the handle work, which is where you develop those higher order skills, I don't quite know how you actually get to be the person who runs the high court case. That would be my response. And, and, and may I just say, um, so Susskind started to wind that back a bit as well. He's, he's now said that you can't carve things up horizontally, that, that lawyers need to be a, a, across the whole remit. There's just, it's just their engagement. So now it's a combination of legal expertise, process and technology. Um, and it's more a vertical carve up. It might not, you might not do so much up the vertical chain, but again, thinking about ethics and responsibility and, um, and not putting in a chat GPT you know, submission, um, th there's, I, I was grateful to see that he went back because remember Susskind also said we were all gone um, a couple of decades ago. But well, so didn't we're back he say we're all gone? Doesn't he always say there was a question mark at the end? Well, I don't, anyways, he's, he's walked back a bit, so we're, we're still a little bit alive. And we've got time for just one more question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Nick Kitchen from the University of Wollongong. And my question actually really goes to your last point when you were earlier talking about the perhaps loss of literacy in law students. And I was wondering when you were saying that whether we're making an assumption about how AI would change legal decision making. So I'm not really talking there about the lower level automated decision making, but my, I mean, what might happen higher level? What might happen to high court cases? Could we expect the AI to um, extract the ratio from the OBITA and instead decide into those four points that Toby was talking about? And then will there really be that expectation for literacy for our students? So I'm just, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a hypothetical. So you're touching So I can, t I can tell you at the moment, it can't summarise the Mabo decision or any single judgment in the Mabo decision. That's just at the moment. And that's, that's 3.5, not even four. And I know, and, and that's trite. I, know, I understand what you're saying. And that's just today, right? So will it be able to do that? Maybe. Will it be able to find a ratio when there isn't one? I don't know. So, so, my, my, hypo <laughs> so my, hypothetical, my hypothetical back is why can't it understand the Mabo decision? It's because the judges can't write clearly. Mm. So imagine that you've now got all parliamentary council and you've got all judges running the drafts of legislation and courts through AI to make sure that it's semantically clear. Then AI should be able to interpret it back to the four dot points, which comes back to Toby's point. Maybe we can reduce judgments down to four dot points and get rid of the judgment in the middle. Uh, it, it's going to be an interesting world. 
And even if, even if humans, judges and humans are left as making the important decisions, you already see this in, in the US and various places, is that there's a lot more data and analysis done of those humans. You can actually now ingest all of a judge's decisions and now give a statistical uh, number. And that's going to decide a lot of law. People are going to look at those numbers and say, this is too risky to, to pursue this, or you know, all the balance of probabilities, this is going to be worth um, trying a punt with this judge. Um, so as a, a judge, I'd be rather nervous that these technologies are going to be used against me. So, so that's always been done implicitly. So, yeah, exactly. so you, you, it's going to be easy to do th that's and right. done at scale th that's and right. done on their judgment, done on everything they've ever written. Um, okay. I'm not sure what sort of world that's going to be. And litigation funders are already using that. They've been using that for a long time. So a litigation funder will anal assess, assess the risk based on based on the, uh, you know, the analysis of, of the facts, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's actually already affecting the legal ecosystem because you are stopping cases that might have gotten up because of the nature of the common law and the development, right? But which are deemed to be too risky. And whereas once upon a time, maybe they might've gone ahead and now they haven't gone ahead. So we will, we're already a decade into a changed legal ecosystem as a consequence of technologies. Thank you very much. So, so can I just say, because Alex and I just had a little chat just then while you were saying that, Kate, and I think that also um, opens up the opportunities for, for what the value add of, of the human is in those circumstances, because yes, you can risk, you know, you can black and white it, but that's not, that's not what clients want from good lawyers. Is it they, what they want from good lawyers? Is some is some professional judgment, ethics, you know, proper proper bill of costs or whatever. But what they also want is some sense of of your relationship with the world going forward and and how you can live with whatever the legal decision is and how that can you know how how you operate in in your world with the tactical advice that's been made. Thank you very much. And on that note, I'm going to make like chat GPT and boil it down to two more points. First of all, can we thank our panel associate, Professor Kate Galloway, Professor Toby Walsh, Professor Sally Kift, and Professor Alex Steele very much for an amazing panel. And with that, and secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, drinks will be served upstairs on level one. Um, from right now. Thank you very much, everyone.